So welcome everybody. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm Director of the Policy Institute at King's College London and it's a real pleasure for me to be hosting this event discussing Anu Shafiq's fantastic book, uh, What We Owe Each Other, A New Social Contract. Um, the book perfectly reflects a key theme of our work at the Policy Institute on inequality, meritocracy and fairness, and for our partners in this event series, the Fairness Foundation, which is a new initiative that's seeking to change the terms of the debate about fairness in the UK. Uh, and this event is the latest in a series that we've been doing with the Fairness Foundation. It's had Michael Sandel, uh, Michael Marmot and Selena Todd, among others, and some great panelists uh, who've come, on, come to outline their thinking. Um, so Manushi's book asks, what does society owe each of us and what do we owe in return? And it's these questions, the social contract, uh, that shapes our politics and economic systems um, throughout our lives at different stages. So, uh, but currently work with, the, with growing uh, both political and economic instability, many believe that contract isn't working uh, for them. So in answer to that, Manoush examines different societies across the world and shows how the urgent challenges of technology, demography, climate, and so on, uh, require uh, a major shift in our priorities. And she suggests a new model built on key principles that provide mutual security and opportunity. And uh, personally, as someone who has a particular interest in generational and intergenerational perspectives, it was great for me to see Manoush addressing that in the final chapters uh, of the book. As I uh, do believe that, um, personally believe that uh, how life chances are increasingly set by our familial resources will be a key story of the coming years as that huge growth in private wealth will flow down very unevenly uh, into future generations. But I should also say just finally on the book that one of the aspects I like most is that it tries to keep a sense of optimism, um, that the challenges that we're facing could be uh, varied and huge, but looking at the history of all this, we can affect change. Um, so Manoush is director of the LSE and is a former and youngest ever vice president of the World Bank. She's held positions as a permanent secretary at the Department for International Development, um, deputy manager director of the IMF and deputy governor of the Bank of England. Uh, and on, in those roles, she worked on major policy upheavals across the globe, uh, including the fall of the Berlin Wall, Arab Spring and the financial crash in 20, uh, 2008. Uh, Manoush was made a dame in 2015 and in 2020 appointed as a cross-bench cross peer in the House of Lords. So really looking forward to hearing a summary uh, Manoush will give of her book, which we'll have first. Uh, and following that, we'll hear the thoughts and reflections from a really excellent uh, panel again today. Uh, we are first from Diane Coyle, who's co-director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she's also a director of the Productivity Institute, a fellow of the Office for National Statistics, uh, expert advisor on the National Infrastructure Commission and senior independent member of the SRC's uh, council. Uh, then we'll hear thoughts from Daniel Suskind, who's a fellow in economics at Oxford, University and a senior associate at the Institute for Ethics in AI at Oxford, uh, as well as a research professor at King's here at King's with us. And finally, we'll hear from Ryan Shorthouse, who's the founder and chief executive of Bright Blue, which is an independent think tank for liberal conservatism. And Ryan is also a visiting fellow here at um, the Policy Institute at King's. Uh, and then after we've heard from the panel, we'll have time for questions. We've got a nice tight hour session here today. So um, we're gonna keep things quite tight on both um, uh, Manushi's outline and uh, panelists' contributions to leave time for questions at the end. But we have got a large number of attendees today, so do get your questions in early uh, to have a greater chance of, of me managing to get to them, but I'll, I'll do my best. So given that time pressure, I'll hand straight over to Manoush to give us her introductory thoughts. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you for that kind introduction. I will give a brief synopsis of the main arguments of the book. And the basic hypothesis is that the reason we have divided societies and the rise of populism in so many countries is that the social contract underpinning our economic system is broken. I think what broke it is the combination of technology and the changing role of women. Technology because it's changed the nature of work, and what we need from our educational systems and the changing role of women because our whole social contract was premised on the assumption that women would look after the young and the old for free. And now with an increasingly educated female population, that model doesn't work very well anymore. And we are, um, 
we are losing the opportunity of taking advantage of the talents of all of these women. Additional stresses on the social contract have also come from aging and from climate change. And what I try and do in the book is really uh, inspired by, by, by Beveridge's idea from cradle to grave, to start from the cradle and how we raise children, how we educate them, what happens when you get sick, what happens when you go to work, and what happens when you grow old, and what is the social contract between the generations. And by going through those stages in life, I try and show how the social contract is broken as it's currently constructed, and then give an indication of what a better social contract could look like. I'll just give a couple of examples just to illustrate the, the argument. Say that, that our educational systems. We currently have educational systems throughout the world, which are on the assumption that education goes roughly from the age of about six to your early 20s. And that's when you build up your human capital, and that's supposed to last you for the rest of your life. Now, we know from all the brain research that's been done in the world, that the first thousand days of life are really where all the action happens in terms of cognitive development. And so educational systems that don't try and reach out to very young children are unlikely to make significant progress on social mobility in particular. Uh, and if you want to equalize opportunities, you have to think very much about those early years. Similarly, we know that because of aging, our careers are going to be much longer and we need to design an educational system that enables people to come back into it frequently throughout their adult life. And so in the book, I argue that a better social contract would be an educational system that isn't so narrowly focused on those years of roughly six to your early 20s, but really thinks about the building of human capital across a much longer span from birth, essentially, to pretty near death. <laughs> um, so that's one example. Another example is around employment and what's happened to work. And I think my, my co-panelists have thought a lot about this area. But the essential argument is, uh, is, a, is, a, is an acceptance that flexible labor markets have resulted in huge economic gains and efficiency gains. But they have imposed huge risks on individuals. And many, uh, many of the issues that are commonly debated around precarious work what happened to people during COVID unable to take sick leave when they were sick because they wouldn't get paid. Uh, that, that those issues reveal the fact that our current labor markets impose huge risks on individuals without providing them either enough security or opportunity to retool and find new jobs. And so in the book, I, I come out very much in favor of the sort of the flex security model, which accepts flexibility, uh, but provides workers with much more security. If you look at some of the, the Nordic countries, they have incredibly flexible labor markets. Employers can hire and fire at will. Severance payments are not very common. Uh, and so people lose their jobs all the time. They have the highest labor turnover in Europe. But it isn't a source of great social anxiety because people who do lose their job get unemployment insurance that's close to 80% of their previous wage. They don't experience a large drop in their well being. They are very quickly put into training and very quickly got back into work, resulting in the highest employment rates in the world. And so I think we can, we can achieve that magical combination by, as we have done in the UK, making pensions portable, we need to think about making benefits portable. And if you work for three employers a week, each one of those employers should be contributing a bit to your parental leave entitlement, to your training, to your pension, and so on. And I think that's how a better social contract, which mandated that employers pay those benefits, regardless of the nature of the flexibility of the contract of workers, would be, uh, would be a much better model. More generally, I think the three principles underlying what I think would be a better social contract are that there should be a minimum below which no one should go. I'm not a fan of universal basic income. I'm sure we'll debate that. But I think something like uh, cash transfer schemes to low income households, earned income tax credits, which keep people above a certain level are far better and provide continuing incentives to work. The second principle for me is investing more in capability. Uh, so early years, lifelong learning, 
uh, making putting a level playing field in place for those who don't go to university to be able to continue to invest in their skills. And that's why I argue for the lifelong learning entitlement uh, in the book, which the government is currently looking at. The third principle is sharing risks more sensibly. Risks around unemployment, around illness, uh, also around old age. I must confess, I find it the shift away from defined benefit pension schemes to defined contribution schemes is, is problematic when 90% of the population doesn't know the difference between a stock and a bond. And you're asking people to make huge decisions about their income in old age when they, when they really don't necessarily have the skills to do that. Whereas I think collective defined contribution schemes where some of those risks are pooled is a much better way to share risks while still giving people some pension autonomy. In general, what I'd say is that our current social contract is inefficient because it's too individualistic and puts too many risks on individuals. And if we invested more in each other, investing in early years, lifelong learning and better security, but also asked more of each other in the form of longer, longer careers, working longer, later pension ages, contributing more to uh, social goods through taxation, that I think that kind of social contract, which had higher investment, but higher expectations, would be both more, provide people with more security, provide people with more opportunity, and I would argue would be more efficient economically. It's not a big state, more welfare state kind of model. It's an increase the mutual obligations to each other and, and use the talent in our societies better kind of social contract. Now, some people will ask, why now? There's, you know, we've got the triple crises of COVID, conflict, and climate, and is this really a time to rethink our social contract? Um, well, someone reminded me that Beveridge wrote his report when the bombs were still falling on London. Uh, so, so you do have to think about these longer term issues in, in moments of crisis, particularly because it is when you have crises that you get windows of political opportunity that open up. And I think we're at such a critical juncture when a lot of these pressures have been building up for years, uh, and COVID is one more layer on top of that. Uh, and I think this is a moment to rethink those long-term questions. And I think a better social contract is both possible and desirable. And, uh, and that's why I wrote the book. I'll stop there. Excellent. Really, uh, really helpful overview, Manoush. Very efficiently done. Um, and just so I'm going to hand over to Diane in a second, just to remind you, do put get your questions in. We've only had one in so far. I think it's people you've just convinced people, Manoush, that this is the, the right way. But I'm sure there are things that people want to clarify or ask. So do, do get your questions in. Uh, and uh, over to you, Diane, for your thoughts, please. Thanks very much, Bobby, and thank you, Manoush. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to start the fireworks flying by disagreeing strongly with Manoush, because I agree a, a, quite a lot with um, her framework in the book. Um, the way I think about it is what's the role of the state or collective arrangements in safeguarding individuals against the risks that they can't either avoid or mitigate themselves. And we've actually been pretty bad at this for a long time. If you think about previous waves of automation in this country and other um, leading economies in the um, early 1980s or the early 1990s, we handled that very badly too. That was the time when lots of people became long-term unemployed and the uh, joint problems of unemployment and ill health and poor housing and poor education all got concentrated in certain places, which is why we're still talking about leveling up so many decades later. And, and there are lots of new risks as well to think about. Um, there's more technical change and the potential for another wave of automation and concerns that it's different this time, that it will happen faster, that it might um, make many more um, existing skills in the labor force redundant and cause more upheaval, yet to, be, yet to be proven, but a big concern for many people. And then of course, we've got climate and biodiversity risks. We've got the pandemic risks and the likelihood of more zoonotic diseases. Uh, we've got new geopolitical risks and also the supply chain risks. So this um, global economy we've constructed with very extended supply chains turns out to have real vulnerabilities at times of pressure. Um, and all of these are 
um, overlaid on each other in ways that cut across uh, different countries and different uh, regions, that cut across gender, that cut across ethnicity, and that cut across generational cohorts. So I do um, entirely agree with Minush, this is absolutely the right time to be thinking about this social contract. And so the question then is, what, what, well, what to do about it? And um, what I find quite depressing and makes me a little bit pessimistic is, is exactly that point that we didn't do it very well before. And now the challenge is even greater. I wrote my first book about the digital economy 25 years ago and made some of these same points about adjusting pension structures and labor market structures to adapt to new patterns of flexibility. And that still hasn't happened. I'm not a fan of universal basic income either because it seems an individualist solution to problems that are collective, but, but something about making the, the old structures of the welfare state like pensions and um, unemployment benefits work better. Um, investing in human capital, uh, education and health as um, the minimum basic platform for enabling people to get on with themselves and try to tackle some of these risks that will face them in life. And similarly, access everywhere for everybody to a minimum level of public services and infrastructure. And that's something that we don't have because there has been um, a single-minded focus on value for money and economic efficiency. It isn't economically efficient to provide universal service, but we need to do that. It's a minimum we ought to give people. And I think above all, we need some systematic thinking about um, risk and resilience. How do we um, understand them? How do we measure them? How do we identify where the risks are? Alongside all of the other indicators that we might think about in terms of, of economic progress. Um, so we are very focused on um, GDP gains. I think there's wide recognition now that that needs to be supplemented to take account of, for example, the depletion of natural assets and thinking about a broader national balance sheet. But I would add to that thinking about what are the risks that societies face in their different ways. And, and I don't think we have a good picture. After all, we were all taken by surprise when one factory um, in Cheshire turned out to produce 60% of the carbon dioxide needed for the food processing system in the UK. So we just don't have a very clear picture of that. And then I think the final point I'd want to make is about um, the politics of this. And this is not my comfort zone. I'm an economist and a, a technocrat. Um, but arguments like the need for flex security or the need to adapt systems of pensions to the way people work now and the kind of flexible labor market you want, they're, they're no brainers really, if you're somebody like me. There seem very obvious reforms to make. And so I think there's an, a question about why, why aren't they being done? Is it that these are system challenges um, and that's just really hard to coordinate? Or is it something about the political system and, and the tram lines that political debate goes along? And um, how does that play into the moment we're in, this moment of multiple overlapping crises and, and, and how can we bring about change? And so I think that's probably a point to hand over to somebody who knows a lot more about that than I do. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, that was excellent. And yes, we're going straight over to Daniel, who has uh, some focus on those types of issues, Daniel. Terrific. Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to be here. Uh, a real, real pleasure to be talking about this, uh, talking about this book. As, as others have said, I think it's an absolutely uh, fascinating book. And as many reviewers noted when it came out, I think it's really you know, timely and really helpful for thinking about post pandemic you know, political and social life. Uh, I, I thought what I do uh, is just share um, three reactions that I had uh, when reading the book in light of my own my own interests. Um, the first was a, a, a reflection about the major parties who we typically think of as being involved uh, in a social contract. Um, what's interesting reading the, the book is that, you know, the traditional view is that a social contract has been between the state, who holds all the political power, uh, and the individual. Uh, and one question I kept on finding myself asking when reading the book was whether or not this bilateral relationship uh, between the state and the individual was still in the 21st century uh, the most important one. Um, now, my particular interest is the impact of technology and particularly AI uh, on, on work and, and society. And one of the worries I keep on coming back to in, in my work is the growing power of the large technology companies who are responsible for developing many of these technologies in the first place. 
And reading this book, it, it really made me wonder if the contract that matters in the 21st century is less and less that traditional one between the individual and the state, and more and more one between these individuals and, and, and large technology companies. And the reason I say this is because it seems to me that the power that these large technology companies have is, is not just economic power any longer. Now, that's what concern does in the 20th century about large companies. We worried about their economic power. We you know, talked about things like market concentration, profitability and pricing, and, and we developed a framework, competition policy, for thinking about how we might intervene uh, appropriately if there was uh, excessive economic power. In, in the 21st century, what's distinctive, it seems to me, about these large technology companies is that they have political power too. Uh, not just the traditional sense of politics, great chambers of state and you know, elected uh, officials, but that broader sense of politics, just about how we all live collectively together in society uh, and the impact that these large companies have on things like liberty and democracy and social justice. So if you, if you take a company like Facebook, yes, there are economic concerns about you know, Facebook's you know, uh, profitability and its market dominance and so on and so on, but really the concerns that animate people are concerns not about economic power, they're about Facebook's political power, the impact they have on the information that we receive, the nature of our deliberation with one another and so on. And so that was one reaction that I had about whether or not this relationship between individuals and the state is necessarily going to be the most important one in the 21st century, given that so much political power is seeping towards these large technology companies. Uh, the second reaction I had when reading the book was just to realize you know, how important the particular words that the book used were uh, mutual obligations, emphasis there on, on mutual, the mutual obligations we have to, to one another in society, uh, that it's important both to recognize um, what the state provides, but also what is asked of individuals uh, in response. Uh, and again, it seems to me that in the 20th century, many people have tended to think of social contracts in practice in a relatively economic way. Uh, to, to use the language in the book, either as a sort of welfare state or as a, a, a piggy bank. But either way, the social contract understood in, in, this, in this way is there to solve an economic problem. It's there to solve a distributional problem. How to share out material prosperity fairly in society, whether that's at any particular moment in time through a welfare state or indeed over time. So uh, through a, you know, this, this idea of the welfare state as, as the piggy bank. But, but the consequence of this economic view is that these social contracts are often thought about in terms of distributive justice. What's the fair way to slice up the growing economic pie in society? But there's also another problem that I think is really important, which is the not just the distribution problem, but the contribution problem. Not just how to distribute income in society, but how to make sure that everybody has a chance to contribute to society and be seen to be contributing. Uh, and, and everyone has so far expressed their dissatisfaction with the idea of the UBI. So I will do the same. I'm not a fan of the UBI either. Uh, and it's for this sort of reason that while a, a universal basic income does a good job of solving the distribution problem, providing everyone with a slice of the economic pie, it doesn't really engage with this contribution problem at all about providing people with a way to, you know, to make a contribution to society. And I, I think these issues of contributive justice uh, are as important in the 21st century as these issues of distributive justice, which currently take up a lot of our uh, attention. And that's one reason why I find the idea of a social contract so uh, appealing. I think it's so valuable because it's rooted in this idea of mutual obligation, that it's not just about uh, you know, what the state provides, but it's also about we, what we as individuals contribute back as well. Um, and the final reaction that I have, and and this is perhaps more of a, a challenge, and I'm interested to hear uh, Manisha's response to this, which is that, as I said at the start, the traditional view of the social contract is that it's between uh, the state and between uh, individuals. And the question that often preoccupies us is, you know, what's the nature of that contract? You know, what, what, is, what does the contract say? But one of the really thorny questions, it seems to me, is... Who are those individuals? Who gets to think of themselves as being members of the political community? Who gets to sign this metaphorical social contract? You know, who is in and who is out? And, and when I look at many of the sort of hard political challenges that we face today, it seems to me they're less about the sort of terms of the contract 
but they're more about who gets to call themselves a member of the community, the political community, who gets to sit down and sign that contract in the first place. If we think of something like Brexit, if we think of something like America first, these are issues about the boundary of the community, about who is a member and who's not a member uh, as well. And so I'm very interested in any reflections on this, not only how the challenges of the 21st century ch you know, challenge the sort of inherited details of the social contract, but also who gets to call themselves a party to that contract as well, who gets to, who gets to be a signatory. Who's, who's part of the political community. Um, so again, thank you very much uh, for the chance to, to read the, the book and to comment. Real pleasure to be here today. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandal. And it echoes, particularly around contributor justice, that echoes themes that we've seen throughout this event series from Michael Sandell through to Michael Marmot and, and Selena. It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a really important a perspective to bear in mind that it's not just about consumption this is about people feeling they have a stake um absolutely great uh so questions are coming in nicely now thank you everyone so it's your last chance so we because we've got ryan up next and then we hear a bit of a response from manush and then on to your questions ryan great thanks bobby and thank you to manush uh it was an excellent book and i really enjoyed reading it i thought it was very precise factful uh, and accessible and really expert use and command of the evidence. You know, you cite really only meta studies or the best evidence rather than kind of grasping at any evidence to support a predetermined ideological argument. So it was a manifesto for centrism uh, in a way. Uh, and indeed, um, I'm often struck that you take, you kind of religiously follow the evidence rather than following some fashionable um, assumptions. So for example, that UBI would be wasteful, the evidence really isn't there to support it, and more generous but uh, demanding and targeted welfare schemes like in Denmark seem to be more effective. Um, but also that automation uh, will often complement rather than necessarily replace work. And that some workers on zero, zero hours contracts, for example, those working for McDonald's in a study use site actually preferred to stay on that more flexible contract than going into a, a more fixed one. Um, and there's brilliant policy tourism in the book as well. I learned a lot there, highlighting innovative and effective practice uh, from around the world. And obviously Scandinavian countries always come up well in these uh, studies uh, and examples, and I was struck by some policies that were floated. So Iceland, the nine months paid paternity leave, three months for women, three months for men, three months shared, and almost all men now take up that leave in Iceland since being in 2000. The Denmark, as I, the Danish workfare scheme, 90% uh, replacement rate that people are getting for a year, but tough uh, mandatory training um, and job placements afterwards. In Sweden, the job security councils working with uh, people at risk of losing their jobs, so well in advance of actually losing it, uh, and the effectiveness of those uh, schemes that are funded by a payroll levy. Um, and generally, I'm very supportive of the direction of travel that Manu sets out in terms of policy. Uh, policy priorities, so the greater sharing of caring responsibilities between men and women, more focus and resources on early years and lifelong education, greater harmonization in the tax and benefits between those in formal and, and informal employment, higher retirement and state pension ages, and more consideration of an investment in natural capital. And the shifting of the burden of taxation away from work onto carbon and wealth so I very much agree with all the direction of travel that Manoush sets out there. Some challenges though, I think at times it felt like I was reading The Economist. It was um, wonderfully illustrative of trends and policies in countries across the world, but not deep enough sometimes for any particular country that a reader may really be expert in. In my case, the, ex, uh, the case of the UK. And I realized the book is kind of aiming for a universalism, aiming to kind of speak to different countries. So that's, that's where it comes undone. But I often craved, I think, more radical and detailed policies. It felt sometimes there was a sort of playing safe 
Um, and often when more radical ideas were floated, there were simply suggestions from others rather than ones that were advocated by Manouche. So for example, Thomas Piketty's um, idea of a capital endowment for all uh, young people, uh, David uh, Runekman's Runek idea of lowering the voting age to six, uh, or Chile's policy of making membership of the pension scheme mandatory. Many, uh, many of the policies that Manouche advocated um, rather than just suggested uh, have already been implemented in the UK or are about to be implemented, like the lifelong learning entitlement, higher retirement ages, increased investment in the early years. So, for example, in terms of sort of craving that more radicalism, if the evidence which Manouche presented around the early years that before age one, it's best to be cared for by a parent, um, that an early return to the labour market is associated with poorer academic achievement, and that from two onwards, actually, it's being in formal childcare, which is associated with better academic and behavioural outcomes. If that's the case, why not make early years education compulsory for two or three year olds? We've made school compulsory from the age of five, so we're not, why not for preschool? But instead, rather disappointingly, I thought um, Minouche concluded that whether the support encourages family-based care or care outside the home, it's a choice that's best left to individuals and families. And I thought that neutrality maybe didn't match with what the evidence was saying. And if the evidence is so strong on parental leave uh, being important, that first year of a child's life, why not make parental pay much more generous than it is at the moment, the statutory amount, 150 quid a week? Perhaps that needs to be much more generous. And also, you know, the focus on lifelong learning, the sort of acceptance that you might have income contingent loans for that just as you go to university. Why not make that for early years as well? Because obviously, there's a sort of bit of restriction on state funding. We can get to universal high quality childcare much quicker if we also offer parents those income contingent loans. I also felt just as a challenge that the book quite rightly thought, uh, pitches the um, pandemic as a possible turning point, much like uh, the New Deal measures came after the Great Depression or the rules-based international order after World War II. But the changes and the problems cited in the book, whether it's unequal caring arrangements, work instability, environmental degradation, aging populations, a lot of these issues predated COVID and I don't think have necessarily been massively affected by the pandemic. I think the pandemic did create problems which were still understanding and still are having impact around things like mental health, learning loss, public net debt uh, and changes the way we work and live, which I think the book didn't have much to say uh, and talk about. Indeed, on public debt, uh, the book does talk about interest rates being quite low. And obviously, we're in quite a different environment now with inflation rising and interest rates rising um, slightly as well. I think the book makes the very fundamental and good point about which is a challenge to some in my political tradition on the right which is that as economies mature, the state necessarily becomes bigger, takes over more responsibilities that were previously and unfairly uh, the kind of domain of families and charities. And so the, the very striking statistic about on average taxes in advanced economies, usually about 30 to 40% of GDP, whereas the tax revenue in developing countries around 15 to 20%. However, despite that, and despite, I think at the start, making a difference between the social contract and the welfare state, the social contract involving a wider range of actors, the welfare state about what the state can provide to the individual, I did feel like some of the proposals were quite statist um, and disproportionately so. Um, so for example, in the comparisons um, around education health, uh, work and pensions, uh, at times it felt that they were being used as prime measures of success. But as Manu says uh, in the health chapter, spending is not always the sign of success. Indeed, there's the highly efficient, inefficient US healthcare system, which spends more than any other country publicly uh, on health. 
And many of the proposals were about the entitlements we should get from the SPA, from the state. Uh, and I would like to have seen more about our obligations, individual obligations to one another. Things like how much should we give to charity? How much caring should we do? Um, how many years of national or caring service should we do? How many charity engagements should we have? How should we reduce our carbon footprint? It felt very much like the book was very much what the state could do. I would have liked to have heard more about what the individual can do. Um, in terms of their contribution. I think it does touch on that slightly when it talks about raising the state pension age and the retirement age. Uh, but often that's framed about the reductions in fiscal costs, when obviously I think the biggest gift that baby boomers can give younger, more jilted generations is to work longer. Uh, and that should be framed as one of the biggest contributions, I think, uh, that the older generations can give to the younger generations. But overall, I really enjoyed reading it. I thought it was a wonderful book, very thought provoking. Um, and uh, thank you for writing it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan, uh, for that. So Manoush, I'll give you a chance just to, if you wanted to pick up any of those comments, it'd be great to hear back. Oh, I think you might be muted, Manoush. Thank you very much for those really useful comments. I'll just make three points because I can't do justice to all of them. But on the first, the first one is around um, why uh, why we've not been successful in addressing some of these issues before when they seem so so bleeding obvious. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting. I, I think both. Uh, Diana and Daniel raised this around which, you know, the countries that succeed are, you know, it's always the Scandinavians who are on the top of every ranking, whether it's on, you know, life satisfaction, happiness, trust, income, educational outcomes, you name it, they're always at the top. And I was trying, you know, and you think about it, what is it, what's distinctive? And, you know, people used to say it's because they're very homogeneous societies. I don't think that's true anymore, actually. Um, it's, they're smaller, so it's, it's hard in big countries to have a better social contract because there are more, there's, there just, it's, there is a, I think there is a scale issue. Um, I think proportional representation helps because when you have winner takes all politics, you get these big divisions and big swings and proportional representation means you have to look after more groups to keep the coalitions together. And the Scandinavians also have this tradition of tripartite industrial relations, where you know government and unions and employers meet all the time, and compromises are forged. Whereas most other countries don't have a well-established tripartite system like that, uh, which means that you know there the risks are managed better in the swings and roundabouts in economic life. And so you can get the unions to do wage restraint in a time of fiscal crisis, and then you kind of compensate them when the economy is doing well. And I think, I think, that, I think that's a big part of why we haven't done, done as well, many countries haven't done as well uh, because of those characteristics. You know, the size, the nature of the politics and the way that tripartite relations work. My second point would be on this question around um, contributive justice. And I, I very much agree that that is a, a big theme. You know, my work, my, the book is really not about redistribution. It's about pre-distribution. And pre-distribution is about investing in people by having everyone contribute more. And I, I very much agree with that. And I do think the debates around contributive justice have gone up the agenda. You know, if you look at the recent Biden billionaire tax or the OECD global tax floor that's been introduced to say there's a minimum level of corporate taxation that we think companies should pay to the communities in which they operate. Um, and, you know, I think if you look at you know, the huge injustices in our tax systems and the way we tax capital versus income so differently and what that's done to wealth inequality in our societies. Two thirds of global wealth is held in the form of property. 
and yet we don't tax property very well uh, in most countries. Um, and it seems to me that you know wealth taxes are difficult, but property taxes are not that complicated actually to implement. Uh, and we could do a much better job of uh, of saying that part of contributive justice is accepting that property that, that that wealth taxes are part of the story. And I think that also speaks to this question of who signs the social contract, who's part of the deal. And I think that that debate is really about who contributes. You only get to participate in the contract if you contribute to its, 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 its functioning. And I think the debate on immigration is exactly about that. What is the debate about immigration? It's when do foreigners get to, get to be part of our social contract? When do they get access to public housing and healthcare and welfare benefits? That's the nub of the issue around immigration. Um, and I think turning that around and saying not do they when do they get benefits, but also when are they expected to contribute, uh, I think helps find, navigate a route through that difficult issue around who's party to the social contract. And then finally, on, um, on the universalism risk, I think that Ryan uh, mentioned, I mean, part of this reflects my own background because I've worked in many countries and I wanted to try and write something probably too ambitiously, something that addressed issues across a wide range of countries. Uh, and so I, you know, I would agree that you would really have to unpack these issues at a country level and to properly cost it and figure out the tax consequences and the investment implications. Um, and I think you can really only be radical at the national level uh, because that's when you can adjust the policy to whether it's socially acceptable. You know, if you made early years compulsory in the UK, which has a lot of appeal actually, uh, that would be a huge debate, but it might just about fly. It would be really hard to make that argument in parts of Asia, for example, or the Middle East. Uh, and so I, I think the more radical ideas are, are, uh, are, to be, are to be really done at the national level. I mean, one other radical idea, which I didn't put in the book because I only uh, read about it afterwards is on the intergenerational issues. And I quite agree. The biggest thing the older generation can do for the young is to work longer. Uh, and I think that's something, work longer, pay taxes on property uh, and accept a carbon tax. I think that would be a gift that older generations, oh, and, and fund the lifelong learning entitlement that's properly funded. I think that's the best gift that the older generation can give the young. Um, but one way to get it done, which would be quite radical, is to say that voting should be weighted inversely to age. Uh, and so the younger you are, the more of a vote you have, because you've got more years to go in that society, which conceptually makes a huge amount of sense, right? Um, politically, very, very difficult to implement. But I think so many of these intergenerational issues are, are driven by the fact that we have a a state which largely caters to the old more than the young. Maybe I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you, Venetia. <clears throat> You've either spotted or anticipated a lot of the questions that came up from the audience. It's great that we covered some of those off. But I just circle back on a couple just to get a kind of uh, overview from you and the panel. <clears throat> uh, and let, let's let's tick off uh, things around universal basic income first. And it's so. One of the questions would uh, is would be interesting to understand why Manush and the panel uh, don't support universal basic income uh, when it would be when it would appear to go to all the issues discussed. And then a sort of supplementary, I'm going to try and group these together, is around contributed justice. And just to say a little bit more about that, I think you've clarified that really well, <clears throat> Manush. But is the question is is this contribution in terms of being in the workforce or in terms of having a greater say? And stake in in the systemic change or policy, or is it both? What is what is that sense of contri contributive justice? So, any any additional points on why we're not supported with UBI beyond that, and anything more on contributed justice? Anyone, Daniel? I think I saw your hand go up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, so the UBI comes up quite a lot. My, my interest is in the impact of automation, and UBI is often a, a response to that challenge. I mean, I sort of, I have issues with the U, the B and the I. Uh, it, it's not obvious that the support needs to be in the form of an income, why it can't be in the form of, say, we heard the language of universal basic services. Um, those are quite similar. The, the word basic is very ambiguous. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of UBI, different people have meant very different things by basic. 
It's one of the reasons that there is, you can find political agreement on opposite ends of the political spectrum and sort of intellectual history of the idea, because some people thought of basic meaning, you know, a floor beneath which no one can fall, but very little indeed. And others thought of it as something that provided people with all the means that they needed to flourish in life, which was something far more generous. And I think even among proponents of UBI, there isn't really agreement on what the basic, the word basic means. My biggest issue, and I, I hinted at it in the comments, is with the universality. Uh, that um, both because, in large part because of this issue of contribution, that a universal basic income is focused solely on these questions of how do we provide everyone with an income in society if, say, they can't rely upon their work to do it. So it solves the distribution problem. But it completely ignores the contribution problem, which is that work is the main way for most people that they are they contribute to society or are seen by other people to be contributing through the work that they do and the taxes that they pay. So in my view, if, if something like a basic income is going to be a serious contender, it needs to be something more like a conditional basic income, a CBI, uh, which, which I write about. But, but even still, I think there's issues with the B and the I, the I as well. My, my reasoning is very different. Um... And it's, there's a reason that Silicon Valley tech bros like the idea of universal basic income is because it's so individualist. Mm -hmm. And if you've got any um, viable level of universal basic income, you're not going to be able to buy yourself a good uh, hospital or a good bus service. There's a, a really collective part to the things that people need to enable them to do what they want to do in life. I love hearing the birds in the background when Daniel speaks. <laughs> it's, it's much better than the drilling in my background. <laughs> One thing on UBI, which I would, I mean, I agree with what's been said, but there's also a sort of difference between a transactional state and a relational state, which is it almost feels as, you know, you give the money and then you sort of wash your hands and you're done. When actually, I think with welfare support, you know, a lot of people think about conditionality as a sort of nasty thing. But often that kind of intensive support, particularly from work coaches and universal credit, there's lots of evidence that that can be very useful in providing the kind of discipline and oversight, which is important to help people um, get work and stay in work. Um, so, you know, it's also about thinking about the state as something that just doesn't give money, but also provides the overarching, overarching support, the relational support that's needed often for very vulnerable people. <clears throat> Anything to add, Manish, before we... I just, I think I, I agree with, with the comments that have been said. I think, the, the, you know, for me, the economic efficiency... I mean, I've, I've worked, I've, you know, when I, when I used to be at the Department for International Development, we designed cash transfer schemes in many low-income countries that, you know, that provide very small amounts of cash to very low-income households. And they make a huge difference, huge benefits for nutrition, educational outcomes, all sorts of things. But the, often these were in countries where 80% of the population is poor. And so making it universal is just, you know, makes sense because there's no point in targeting when you have so many poor people. In any state that's capable of any targeting, it's better to target. I mean, why would you waste resources on people who don't need it? And, and I also just philosophically, I think, I, I think it's giving up on people. I think it's saying you have nothing to contribute to society. And philosophically, I find that very problematic. Uh, you know, we, we know from all the research on happiness and well-being, you know, contr contrary to people like, basically like to work, they like their jobs, they, it gives them meaning and purpose in life. And some jobs are much tougher and less attractive than others. But on average, if you look at recent labor market surveys in the UK, people want to work and they want to contribute. And that's, that's a good thing. Great. So I'm going to move on to another, I'm trying to group these together, and this is a sort of generational grouping, which I think I, I help set the tone for, which I, I like to talk about these generational issues. So we, uh, I've got three sort of interrelated ones. Um, <clears throat> one very straightforward, can the panel highlight the most promising examples of policies or programmes that promote the social contract between generations, um, which is a really interesting one and then ones that are a bit more about the problems in doing this so <clears throat> how does uh the the contract between individuals and the state intersect with previous webinar the policy institute webinars around generational issues it seems at present trickle down of wealth from older to younger generations isn't happening or if it is it's uh, it's it's increasingly relating people's life chances to their family resources and inequality is increasing however the government seems unwilling to intervene in those types of uh, wealth uh, with wealth interventions um 
so interesting the panel's insight of why why that's why the government isn't intervening and how it then can be solved and then finally third one is a sort of more general one but related to that generational theme is how do we convince people who've worked their entire careers under the current system that a new way is possible this is a kind of mm -hmm. challenge gener uh, generally and, and particularly around from a generational perspective about what different cohorts have got used to and the ones in power right now are, are particularly used to uh, an, an older model i guess mm. and maybe Minish. if i could just jump in up on the intergenerational wealth issue you know one of the dilemmas when i was writing the book was you know how do i get people to care about other people's grandchildren because you know intergenerational wealth is such that some people think well i, I can I, you know i can give my children or grandchildren a deposit to buy a house and i can transmit and look after the next generation in that way but that's you know obviously hugely unfair in terms of uh, in terms of opportunities across society and a big problem for social mobility so how do you de-link that and get and i think part of that is is reminding people that your grandchildren are going to live with these other grandchildren <laughs> and if those grandchildren have you know poor education and income prospects and have to resort to criminality and 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 have you know all sorts of health issues that are a problem as a result of low you know do you want do you want your grandchildren to live in that world and i think that's a that's a kind of conversation we don't often have but i think it has to be part of it and the other thing is just in terms of practical policies part of the reason i think piketty's idea about this uh what, you know that everybody gets an inheritance that you tax you tax the stock of wealth away from people and that you give every 21 year old uh, he roughly says 125,000 euros as an endowment and and as a as an inheritance um i mean the politics of that is complicated i would prefer that's why i prefer the lifelong in educational endowment, because I think you can sell that more that you're giving the next generation the means to invest in their in their human capital for the rest of their lives. I worry about the government's current work is it's it's a loan based system and it may not be enough and it will be, you know, there are all sorts of issues around um, the, the debt burden that, that young people will carry. But I, I think that idea of an endowment for all young people that is equally distributed is is a really powerful intergenerational tool. Great, thank you. Diane, do you have any? I'm not sure I do, because I, I think this is very difficult territory. I mean, one um, ch challenge that we're going to face is that the economy is not growing. And um, one of the reasons it's not growing is that we're not putting enough money into human capital formation, and we're creating all kinds of sclerosis, to use um, the, t the term that's fashionable a while ago. So at some point, not having growth does lead to political change, although I think it's quite hard to predict what that would be. Um, I, I think property tax, it would have to be property tax, and it may have to be something like revaluing re um, the value of properties for um, council tax purposes, but that's the only way to get into these inequalities whereby people who've got properties leave it to their own family. And, uh, you know, it would have to be politically, um, uh, dressed as something like we're taxing this to raise more money for the NHS, but then spend it on something that will actually benefit young people. Uh, like education. Yeah. Like education. Oh, really good. Yeah, good thought. Thank you, Diane. Um, Daniel, any reflections? Yeah, maybe on that last question about how to actually do this. Uh, mm -hmm. And it feels, and it goes back to the comments that, you know, Minouj may makes time and again in the book, but also in her, her comments today, about there being a sort of you know, this post-pandemic moment, post-pandemic -pandem moment is a sort of, there is a, there, there are two features about it. One is that there's a sort of political malleability at the moment. There's a sense, given we've seen the state over the last two years do things in terms of scale and ambition and impact that would have seemed unimaginable you know, three years ago. That, and to some extent, they've been you know, a relative success. Um, so that, that's one thing that there's a sort of malleability in our conception of what the state can achieve. But the second thing is that it's just quite clear that the pandemic has disproportionately hit young people. And if you're trying to make a case that now is the time to do something to help young people, having been through an experience in which young people have been disproportionately hit through the interventions we've had to adopt, it seems like this is this is the moment. So you know, if you're trying to if you're trying to build a case that a that malleability, but b the fact that it's young people that have been particularly hard hit, it seems to me that this is a a good moment to be thinking about these these sorts of interventions. 
May I just a quick word? Yeah, please. I mean, I think we're related to why making a big investment in education of the next generation is the best gift we can give. A high rate of return, average 10% globally. UK numbers are even higher, especially if you look at externalities. But I also think it links to this previous discussion about automation and the labor market. We are quickly moving into a world in which secondary education is not adequate for a good life, uh, where everyone will need some kind of tertiary education. It may not be university, it may be something else, but, but to have a good life, you need to have tertiary education, whether it's further education, technical training or something. And we need to finance that. And that's an investment in future human productivity. And I would argue that we're underinvested in that. Interesting. And that's how you deal with the intergenerational justice. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, I guess I suppose the emerging evidence from the pandemic is that, yes, young people were hit hardest economically in terms of being kicked out of the labour market, but then it's older people that have had greatest struggle getting back in to some degree. And in, in some ways that makes the point of um, lifelong learning and the interconnections between generations on lots of these issues. So it is, uh, shows we're more connected than separated on this, which is really important. Uh, Ryan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just, just quickly on um, wealth taxation, which I agree with. Um, I mean, I would say there's sometimes a tendency, I mean, we saw this with the Labour Party, instead of doing the health and social care levy, which is obviously increasing payroll taxes, you know, we should be looking at to increase it on inheritance and capital gains tax. No way are the changes that you need to make 12 billion going to come from changing inheritance and capital gains tax. And as Manoush says in the book, it's very hard to raise quite significant amounts of money from those types of taxes just because the numbers and numbers of people involved and also the sophisticated ways that they can uh, reduce their tax liability. So we just have to be um, conscious of that. Um, the second thing I'd say is that, you know, that sometimes the public discourse is baby boomers are really selfish, but actually baby boomers are transferring more money, but to their own children, which goes to the point of, um, you know, that widening inequality across the board. Um, I think what is interesting, and Manoush does touch on this in the book, is the phenomena around boomeranging. So people in their 20s returning to live with their parents. And of course, this connects generations more. And some people see this as a negative thing, uh, kind of thwarts independence, kind of restricts people's um, kind of labor mobility. But I think what will be interesting is that for example, people who have parents who live close to or in London um, might have an advantage. I mean, this is around all big cities, may have an advantage that they can live with their parents and therefore save quite a lot of money to accumulate um, the deposit, for example, for a house. So I think you might, interestingly, in, in the future, you might see not only the inequalities based on parental background, but on geography as well. So those with parents who are close to or in cities may have more of an advantage in terms of being able to accumulate more wealth. In terms of what baby boomers can do, uh, I'm thinking about the housing thing, it's right about having a new form of property taxation. Uh, and I sympathize with revaluating uh, re council tax, for example. But I think another thing to think about is often, um, can we provide boomeranging for people who are not our own children? So can we open our doors, you know, if we're part of the older generation, we have bigger houses. Can we rent out rooms, make them, uh, you know, and just be sort of a bit, can that generation be a bit more sort of opening in terms of lodges, et cetera? And this does happen a bit at the moment, but can, can public policy incentivize that a little bit more to bring generations together and allow the baby boomers to help people in their 20s other than their own children? Mm. Thank you, Brian. I did hope to get around another set of questions, but I failed in getting to them. Uh, but that was a uh, excellent Excellent discussion. I um, uh, just wanted to pass it back to Manoush for any final words or reflections before I give my thanks. Anything anything to add? No, just really uh, so grateful that, that, you know, that we're debating these issues and I hope that we continue to do so because we certainly need to do something. So, 
Thank you. So, I mean, that, that all it is left for me to do is to thank everyone for coming, for your great questions, really, really good questions, where we couldn't get to quite all of them, um, to the teams at the Policy Institute and the Fairness Foundation, uh, particularly Will Snell, for putting all these events together, to our excellent panel, and of course, to Manoush. Um, thank you very much. This, this event will be added to our YouTube uh, that you can uh, so you can share it with others and then look out for more in our series coming soon. Great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.